Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. In another week where we have spent, if we're living in Melbourne, we've spent the time in stage four lockdown still in our homes. And there's been some distressing news about people that we love and people that we know. We hear the psalmist begin by saying, what if the Lord were not on our side? And I've been thinking about that question as I listen to the news and hear some of your news. Peace to you this week. And then we light this candle to remind ourselves that Jesus is the light of the world. A light no darkness can extinguish. Thanks be to God. I invite you to the call to worship. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the bread breaker, the light gatherer, the cross carrier, welcome. May the peace of the Lord Jesus, the peacemaker, and the temple disturber, friend of the sinner, and the companion on the road be with us all. Let us draw close to the Lord Jesus, the Saviour, the Healer, the Teacher, and worship him. And ask ourselves, who do we say he is? And with that question, I invite you now to hear this meditative singing of our next song, Lord you are the light of life to me.
Merciful God, we confess how easy it is for us to begin to adopt the attitudes and actions of the world around us, to let our lives be shaped by contemporary culture rather than by your call. Lord, in your mercy, hear and forgive. We confess how often we think of our own interests first, more concerned with our own status and well-being than with the well-being of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear and forgive. We confess that we have not always treated one another as valued members of your body, the Church, that we have allowed intolerance and resentment to tear us apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear and and forgive. forgive. We confess that we do not always acknowledge you as Lord, trusting in our own abilities and following our own goals, rather than submitting ourselves to your will and your call. Lord, in your mercy, hear and forgive. forgive. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, transform us, change us from the inside out, so that our words and our lives would bring honour and glory to you, our Saviour, and Lord. Amen. Amen. And this is the best of all. When we are empty, God fills us. When we are disheartened, God is compassionate. When we are wounded, God brings healing. When we confess our sins, God forgives. In Christ, through Christ, and because of Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. from the New Living Translation. What if the Lord had not been on our side? Let all Israel repeat, what if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us? They would have swallowed us alive in their burning anger. The water would have engulfed us. A torrent would have overwhelmed us. Yes, the raging waters of their fury would have overwhelmed our very lives. Praise the Lord who did not let their teeth tear us apart. We escaped like a bird from a hunter's trap. The trap is broken and we are free. Our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is a reading from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 8. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviours and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace... God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, 
serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Today's Gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20, and we're reading from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, What are people saying about who the Son of Man is? Some people think he is John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Jesus pressed them. And how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon answered, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, lets you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. And then Jesus swore the disciples to secrecy. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. My small reflection this morning comes from Romans chapter 12. And I've kind of put the title God's Exchange Rate. I grew up before we had plastic notes. And I was probably around 10, 11, 12, and I got a $5 note as a birthday gift. I put it in my pants pocket. My mum ended up washing those pants, and the $5 note came out looking worse for wear. There was parts of it that were missing, obviously gone to join where all socks that get lost in the wash go. There was parts of it that obviously disintegrated. And it raised in my mind, is it worth anything? Is it still of value? My mum helped me flatten out that wet ball and smooth it out and get the pieces that we could find and we take them together, put it back together as best we could and then we went down to the bank. We looked for the female bank teller because they're always much more gracious and the female bank teller shook her head but then smiled and took that battered and torn and disgruntled piece of paper and put it in her drawer and handed back a brand new note. And for that young boy, me, it was a relief. That's kind of what's happening in this passage today. Now I want to tell you, I'm going to make a personal application, but the passage really does have a corporate agenda. And I'm going to encourage you to make that that transition to what this means for us as a church. Because Paul reminds the church in Romans that through Jesus, God acted to bring about salvation to the whole world, first to the Jew and then to everybody else. And in chapter 11, he makes this reference that judgment was upon us all. And yet God's love and desire is that everyone through faith should live. And then this chapter 12 opens up and it says, Therefore, on the basis of God's mercy, you, me, brothers and sisters, we are meant to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, we live in a world that has a perfection of what a body should look like. 
And so here's an interesting challenge because Paul's context was the idea of sacrifice in the temple. And when a, an animal was bought for sacrifice, it had to be perfect in every way. There meant to be no blemishes on it. So what does it mean, mean for me to be a living sacrifice when I'm overweight and unfit and I'm torn and broken and disfigured and I'm unable to do what I could do when I was 40? The question is, do I need to go through a diet to please God? Do I need to enrol in a gym and work up to being an acceptable living sacrifice? What do I need to do for me to be perfect if I'm going to be holy? Is there a connection? And what about those of us who just, are, are, because of no fault of our own, are never going to measure up to the world's fashion standards? And what about those of us who, through carelessness, have lived a life that's left us broken and agitated and rinsed and spun and no longer looking like we used to. Are we without hope? Are we going to be ever able to be that living sacrifice? Or are we always going to be unacceptable at God's table? See, and that's why I love the gospel. Because it is good news that God is not interested in bodily perfection, although I do think he is concerned about us being overweight and what we have done to our bodies. But he is not on the same page as our fashion magazines of what we need to be and to do to look good and healthy. Paul emphasises that God is after a relationship. And our part in building that and maintaining that relationship is for us to stop and to ask ourselves, how are we conforming to the world's agenda? To ask ourselves, how is the world's paradigm shaping the way I live? What kind of shape is my soul in? Is it pure and unblemished? Am I able to live up to the task of when it talks about truth and trust and love? Or will I limp along full of aches and pains of doubt and confusion and fights? The world often sees the church as a group and gathering of hypocrites. And I guess the Royal Commission has proved some of that to be true. And I suspect that some of us look at our churches and say, we're never going to be perfect. Look at the occasional arrhythmia that we have, the irregularities and the inconsistencies in our behaviour, the occasional shortness of spiritual breath that is at work. It's as almost as if we as churches have been through the washing machine of life and it's left us worn out and torn and broken and dysfunctional. Oh, yes, we talk about going out on a limb for God and climbing the highest mountain. And yet, when we are challenged to let go of some of our bank balance, to take our hands off some of our programs, to do something different, for example, move to doing services online, we kind of say, oh, no, not us. To push the metaphor even a little further. Many of our churches would be classified as unpresentable. I look at a personal level at other ministers that seem to be doing a really good job. Their churches are growing. Their pews are full. Their bank balances are overflowing. And I think to myself, what do I need to do to be like them? What do I need to do to be perfect? How do I reach that same standard? And that's why I love the gospel story, because it says to me, God is not interested in me equating myself against others. All that God wants of us as a church on Carrick Drive in Elmhurst, on Roberts Road, on Sydney Road, Camberfield, to offer what we have. Despite our imperfections, despite our limitations, and if we're willing to wholeheartedly sacrifice what we have, we may see 
an amazing outpouring of God's will working and through us. Just as any bank will take a crumpled and torn bill and values it as highly as one that's perfect, that's what God does with us. That is the good news. That is the gospel. When we offer what we are, what we have to God, God looks at us through the eyes of Jesus and sees perfection. When we are willing to sacrifice all that we are, body, heart, soul and mind to God, God is able to take our imperfections and make them perfect. Perishable becomes the imperishable. Our humanity, our brokenness becomes whole. These, those deformations that we have that we want to hide become the thing that God can use to create transformation. That's what spiritual worship is. Rejecting the world's agenda, the world's standards and offering what we are, the good and the bad, the perfect and the imperfect to God and allowing God's will to be expressed in and through us. I come back to that $5 note that went through the wash. If the Australian government is able to take that note that was wrung out and mutilated and stuck together with sticky tape and seeing it as equal value as a perfect note, how much more will God take us and transform what we offer into an image of perfection? The perfection of the one in whose, whose name we worship each Sunday. Jesus, who do you say he is? The Messiah, the Son of the living God. May God be gracious as we continue in worship, in sharing together an affirmation of faith. Who do you say I am? When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He then asked them, Who do you say I am? Lord, you are the bread of life that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You are the good shepherd who lays down his own life for the sheep in his care. You are the way, the truth and the life, the path by which we come to know God the Father. You are the light of the world, illuminating the way for all who walk in darkness. You are the resurrection and the life, the source of eternal life for all who believe. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God and our Redeemer and Lord. Amen.
We invite you to join us in the prayers of the people based on this question of Jesus. Who do you say I am? Lord Jesus, you are a Lord who walks beside your people. So we pray for people who walk for justice. You are a Lord who raises up those who are bent low. So we pray for those held down by the grinding of life and the indifference of the world. You are a Lord who feeds the hungry. So we pray for all who long for bread and the means to provide it. You are a Lord who celebrates the small and the insignificant. So we pray for the children and for those who are never noticed. You are a Lord who says, follow me. So we pray for courage and faith that we may take up the cross and find it leads to life. You are a Lord who heals the sick and comes alongside those who grieve. So we pray for mercy to our world in the grip of pandemic, mercy to the decision makers, the healthcare workers, the sick and the dying. Now let us lift up to God the names of all those we carry in our hearts, for whom we would especially seek God's care.
Hear our prayers, tender God, and accept them in the spirit of the prayer your Son taught us. Our Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we come to the benediction. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And this morning we have joined with millions who have gone before and say he is the Messiah. Jesus has stood with us and taught us that there are realities of being disciples. And so too this morning we join with millions who have gone before us and say we are going to rise to the challenge of what it means to be a disciple. Jesus has stood with us this morning and offered us spiritual food and drink for the journey. We go being fed and nourished to live our discipleship in a world in which we serve. Jesus stands with us and before us, shining in glory, and will be with us to the end of the age, to which we say, thanks be to God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ And the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Our closing uh, clip this morning comes from Doug. I think it is a beautiful illustration of the passion with which we are to live our discipleship. It's called the conductor, and I thank Doug for the clip. Hope you enjoy.